This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez in Chicago. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. At least 2,500 people have died in Morocco following a 6.8 magnitude earthquake Friday night. Another 2,500 people were injured. The death toll is expected to keep rising. The epicenter of the 6.8 magnitude earthquake was in the high Atlas Mountains, located about 44 miles from Marrakesh. Many villages remain inaccessible. Some areas can only be reached by helicopter. The hardest hit areas are among the poorest in Morocco, where many homes lack electricity or running water. The earthquake also damaged parts of Marrakesh, including its old city, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. These are some of the residents in Marrakesh describing what happened when the quake hit Friday night. I live on Mela Street in Medina, the old city of Marrakesh. The earthquake struck around 11.30 p.m. At that time, I was out shopping near Jama Al Fina Square. I left my son and daughter at home. I was terrified when I saw the house is shaking violently, almost as if in a nightmare. I rushed back home, gathered our clothes and blankets, and prepared to sleep outside. We have lost nine people that I know of, including a family member and her newborn on Sabara Street. I don't know what to say. It was such a surprise. We were sitting here when this catastrophe happened, and the wall collapsed. There was a tailor in this shop, and he was leaving, and the wall collapsed on him. We got him out. We didn't know what fell on him. We didn't know he was there. People came and dug to find him and got him out. Morocco declared three days of mourning for what's become the deadliest earthquake to hit the country in over six decades. At the time of the quake, Morocco's King Mohammed VI was in Paris, where he owns a mansion near the Eiffel Tower. He was returned to Morocco, but hasn't spoken publicly yet about the growing humanitarian crisis. The king also hasn't publicly requested international assistance. Morocco's accepted aid offers from Spain, Britain, Qatar and the United Arab Emirates, but it has not responded to an offer from France. We're joined now by two guests. Brahim El Ghabli is chair and associate professor of Arabic studies at Williams College, author of Moroccan Other Archives, History and Citizenship after state violence. He's from Urzazat, uh, Morocco, which was hit by the earthquake. And joining us from Marrakesh is Abdullah El Halawi, uh, the head of the English department at Qadi Ayad University. He's also the director of the Master of Linguistics and Advanced English Studies. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Um, let's begin in Marrakesh. Um, let's go. Uh, let's go to Abdella El Halawi. Uh, can you talk about the situation on the ground right now? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the situation on the ground right now is uh, very scary. People are worried about the uh, potential after aftershocks. Uh, everybody here is talking about the earthquake and uh, the incident of uh, Friday uh, at eleven eleven. Uh, still hovering, and uh, yeah, it's very scary. Uh, the uh, the death toll is increasing. The last number I have is 2,500, and um, people are still complaining about the the lack of food supplies, and uh, and uh, their houses are all destroyed, especially in the mountainous areas. Professor, you're, you're joining us from Marrakesh. Uh, what happened? Uh, where were you when the earthquake hit? Uh, how did it affect the city? And, and again, uh, there are reports that a lot of the areas in the rural areas are cut off from immediate help. Uh, yes, I am in Marrakesh. I was in Marrakesh. I was at home. Uh, and exactly at 11, 11 p.m., uh, I, was sit I was sitting in the living room, and my little kid was in front of me, and out of a sudden, uh, my, uh, my little kid was shouting, earthquake, earthquake. That was my third, that, that was my third experience with earthquakes, so it was easy for me to recognize that it was an earthquake. We'll, uh, we live in a high building, so we had to, to run downstairs just to find all people crying and shouting. Uh, downstairs, not knowing what happened exactly. Some of them were sure that it was an earthquake, others were not. But uh, thanks God, I mean, we didn't have, we didn't experience any uh, deaths 
in my building and in my neighborhood. My family live in an area which is uh, very close to the epicenter of the earthquake, and some of my family members died there. Um, I'm trying to get in, in touch with them every day just to, to learn about the, uh, their condition, their whereabouts. And it's yes, they are cut off. They are complaining uh, because, I mean, they don't have food. Some of them uh, ha have to sleep. Uh, in open air, open space, because their houses are destroyed. So the situation is still uh, scary and very, uh, uh, very problematic. And and how is the are the local authorities and the government responding uh, to the crisis? Uh, um, uh, I receive very contradictory stories depending on the areas. In some areas, it seems that the authorities are uh, responding in positive ways, trying to uh, to help the, uh, the locals with food supplies, with, uh, with tents, uh, and with uh, sometimes with clothes as well and blankets. But uh, some people in other areas are complaining about the uh, lack of communication with local authorities. I, uh, someone called me yesterday saying that they called the uh, Qaid, the, the gentleman who is responsible for the area, like the mayor of the area, and uh, the response was that he was on vacation and that he could not uh, help them. Uh, so these are some of the rumors, negative rumors that we hear about the uh, local authorities, but we are not sure that's number one and the stories are contradictory most of the time. Um, I want to bring uh, Professor Ibrahim uh, uh, El Gabli into this conversation from Williams College, though your uh, hometown in Morocco, uh, Karzazat, is the epicenter of the earthquake. Also, condolences to both of you for what has happened in your country. I mean, the death toll only expected to rise. If you could talk more about what you're hearing from family, friends, community in Morocco, but also where is the king? This uh, word that we're hearing of growing anger that the king has been absent. Does he even live in Morocco or does he live in France? Well, uh, Amy, thank you so much for having me on your show. It's, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, and uh, these are great questions. Uh, Where is that is a little bit removed from the epicenter of the earthquake. However, because of the way uh, Moroccan governorates or provinces are divided, they do share borders sometimes, like the High Atlas is shared between different uh, between different governorates, and where is that is one of them. And areas closer to the epicenter are affected, like the rural commune of Telwat, the rural commune of Eram, uh, and also uh, Tidili. These are areas that are closer to where the uh, epicenter is, and uh, people's houses uh, uh, are damaged. And of course, there is loss of life uh, in, in the Warzazat area. However, the city itself and the villages around are kind of like luckier and safer, despite the fact that they experienced the shock and the trauma of such a tremendous magnitude that a lot of them had never experienced before. When it comes to government politics and where officials are, and it's a lot like people have been saying a lot of things, I can't really pin down one. I, I, I think the king lives in Morocco, and uh, I think that he went to France like uh, a few days before the earthquake happened. And people, of course, are were left with a lot of questions about like the government, the response of the government, its immediacy, whether it responded urgently and all of that. And these are really interesting questions that they don't have answers to. But what they really think is the most important right now is for the aid and help and for people to really be on the ground to support the families, to think about plans to help people uh, rebuild their homes, kind of like resume uh, a, like some sort of normal life. And the bigger political questions, of course, will be asked later, because I think they can be a diversion if we ask them in the immediate now 
when people are still mourning and people are still trying to just figure out who, who died, who, sur who survived, who is still under the debris, who has a chance of life. And of course, I wrote a book about uh, Moroccan politics and all of that, and I'd be happy to talk about it another time. But for me now, it's really like the focus should be on rescuing people, on getting aid, on making sure that every uh, solvable life is saved and uh, a chance of life is given to the people who are still struggling uh, under under the debris. And of course, like as uh, my colleague Abdullah said, like there are so many like versions and stories and people uh, things that people are saying. Like there are areas that are flooded with aid. And last night I was talking to people in the mountains, like really far, and they're saying there are areas that nobody has reached yet. And they think our message should be that we have to reach these people. We have to make sure that if they have even like a fraction of a percentage of possibility of life, that they be given that chance to survive and live and, ex and continue to exist. And uh, Professor uh, Al Gabli, Al -Gabli. The, uh, the, in addition to the to the loss of the tragic loss of life, there are reports that many uh, historic sites uh, uh, in your country have also been damaged. Uh, do, have you been able to verify that or can give us an idea of what that means? The High Atlas is a really important historical site in Morocco. It, it does not just have classified historical sites that the state has declared as national patrimony or as national heritage, but it has a lot of buildings and constructions that have been important for the Moroccan history. Like in Talwat, there is the Kasbah of Al-Glawi, for example, which is a, a very important national monument. Uh, the, the Mosque of Tinmil, which was destroyed uh, by the earthquake, was built in the 12th century by the, uh, that's the cradle of the Al-Muwahhad empire that extended to Al-Andalus and the most of North Africa. There are also other smaller houses where people like with like saints, for example, like the Mullah Ibrahim saint, for example, that's a very important spiritual location in Morocco. The, the mosque of Kharbush in, in, in Jam al fana in Marrakesh, for example, the whole minaret was, 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 was destroyed. And I'm trying to track down some places that have been destroyed, some of which I know the names and importance, others I don't know. No. So what they've been doing is just aggregate this data and then come up with some writing about it later so that people know about it. And really, the damage is also huge for the architecture in the region. Uh, adobe houses that have been like, they are very eco-friendly types of buildings with thick walls. They are warm in the winter because the winter is very harsh in the Atlas Mountains. And they are cooler. In, in, in the summer. So now I think with this earthquake, what we will see is a total reinvention of air architecture in the area. My hope is that that type of architecture can be strengthened and made earthquake resilient rather than scraping it off entirely, because that would be another way like this, uh, this earthquake is going to change national heritage and national culture in Morocco. In addition, of course, to the fact that the majority of this area is Amazigh. And I hope that an exodus doesn't happen because then people will move into the cities and they would start losing their mother tongue and just become Arabized, which will be a tragedy for a million language like Amazigh. And Professor Abdullah El Haloui uh, in Marrakesh, I mean, the Medina is world renowned, the UNESCO heritage site. When Democracy Now! was in Marrakesh for the UN Climate Summit, we we're just amazed at the history embodied in uh, these buildings and this area. If you could talk more as we wrap up about what you think need, what people need there right now. Uh, if you allow me just to go back to one important point about the mountainous area before I answer your question, I would like to say that this, this uh, disaster, the disaster that people have been undergoing is not only about the uh, earthquake uh, in itself, but it's also because, I mean, the area is mountainous. And because the uh, big, uh, big rocks roll down from the top to the mountain, uh, down uh, the, uh, the the valleys. So many of the stories that I heard uh, witness to the fact that 
the, uh, their houses were not destroyed by the earthquake per se, but by the rocks rolling down. So what's important to say about this is that, about this disaster, is that it's not only about the earthquake. Uh, the, the people living there are suffering from, uh, from very cold winters during the winter time, uh, from uh, floods during the, the summer time. And uh, now we learn that the area is an earthquake area, which means that another type of disaster is added up to the uh, list of disasters they've been undergoing. This is very important to know. Now, going back to your question about Marrakesh itself, I took pictures of some uh, really uh, precious monuments inside Marrakesh, like uh, the Tower of uh, uh, Tarbush, uh, which is one of the oldest uh, prayer towers, mosque towers in Marrakesh that was totally destroyed. I heard some rumors about the Kutubiyat Towers, that it was damaged, but that's not true. I checked the place, I checked the tower, but it was not damaged. Uh, Markish is, uh, is historically well-known uh, for being representative of uh, a very old tra Amazigh tradition in, uh, in Morocco. And now the fact that I mean, Marrakesh and the areas around it are being affected in this way. There's always this risk of this Amazigh tradition being, uh, that it may uh, be undermined uh, and that this uh, potential exodus of people, because that's a, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, as far as I can see, uh, it will be a necessary uh, consequence of uh, this disaster. Uh, because of this, there is this, there's always this potential risk of losing this heritage, linguistic heritage and architectural heritage as well. Well, I want to thank you both for being with us. Abdella Al-Haloui, the head of the English department at Qadi Ayad University, also the director of the Master of Linguistics and Advanced English Studies, speaking to us from Marrakesh, which is about 40 miles from the epicenter in the Atlas Mountains of this earthquake. And Brahim el Ghabli, chair, associate professor of Arabic studies at Williams College. Thank you so much both for joining us. We will continue to cover what happens in Morocco.